Welcome to Public Safety Talk Radio, the podcast for all of our heroes in public safety, including law enforcement professionals, firefighters, EMTs, corrections officers, healthcare workers, and more. The show is produced by the POCUA and is founded upon its Soundness Initiative. This episode is sponsored by the finest service organization, a provider of line of duty death loan protection through many of our POCUA institutions. I am Ken Bader, your host for Public Safety Talk Radio, and I am here with another intriguing, interesting guest, um, somebody from a section, from a genre, whatever you want to call it, that we've never had before. It is Laney Hobbs, who is the podcast host of True Crime Cases with Laney. Um, just as importantly, she is the founder and one of the managers of the True Crime Podcast Festival. And we're going to talk about something that we don't talk enough of or about on this show, which is victim advocacy. Lainey, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. I didn't know I was the first true crimer. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know what? We, we've had other true crime podcasters on here. We had uh, one of the great hosts from Paradise uh, After oh, Dark yeah. here. We've had the prosecutors on here. Um, so we certainly have had other podcasters and other true crime podcasters. But we've, uh, never, but we've never talked about victim ad- advocacy. Yes. And I think that you are like the poster person uh, for leading the charge for victim yeah. advocacy. You know, you have a triple threat here, right? So, <laughs> sorry, guys. Game over. There you go. <laughs> Game over with this one. So, you know, in in conversations that I've had with you through some of my work in Podcast Magazine, it's obviously clear that victim advocacy is one of your top principles. Um, so much so that it's becoming kind of the crux for the True Crime Podcast Festival, which is both good and slightly, not a lot, but slightly unusual. Talk about victim advocacy and what you're doing for victim advocacy in your podcasts and in your events. So victim advocacy really wasn't a huge thing for me when I started my podcast. had no idea about what it meant, what it looked like, or, you know, that these people were real. I had an idea of them, but until I started meeting some of the survivors and some of the family advocates, um, none of that really kind of perforated my, my being, if you will, like my atmosphere of, you know, creating true crime content was never penetrated by anybody associated with crime. Um, It wasn't until I met Sarah Turney, who is an Mm -hmm. incredible victim's advocate. Her sister, Alyssa Turney, um, went missing. And um, I don't want to talk too much about the case to preserve everything that's going on there and to respect her wishes. But, um, you know, she's made an indelible mark on the podcast, you know, industry and true crime industry. And so I take a lot of my initiative from her. I see what she's doing. I'm inspired by that. And so for me, victim advocacy, because I'm I'm a survivor of crime, but not in the same way mm-hmm. that some of these individuals are, where they've had loved ones, you know, taken from them prematurely, or they were survivors of crimes that are really horrific. Um, so for me, victim advocacy is really checking in with why the story is being told. Who does it benefit? And is it going to help? Am I sharing this case because... I want to help somebody be aware of, you know, things that are going on, a surrounding or, you know, being socially aware of what's happening, Mm -hmm. you know, in their, in their space. Um, Or do I want to, you know, share this for the salaciousness of it? Like, this is a good story and I just want to share it to share it. And I don't care who knows or how anybody feels about it. Cause there are people out there who are like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are people who consume that content. And so to them, I say, you will find a show for yourself that you will like, it will never be my show. Um, And none of my friends shows, which is, you know, a great thing. Um, So for me, it's really just checking in to, to determine why the story needs to be told and trying to make a difference within our community. We we can consume true crime content ethically. It's possible. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be this conglomerate, you know, media company behind it that tells us this is good or anything like that. We've seen the um, we've seen podcasters come together against the A and E network for the Gabby Petito story. You know, we realized that the Petito family was not for the documentary or the made for TV movie, mm-hmm. and so we all declined 
the um, ad space drop. They wanted to do a fee drop promoting it. And so, you know, we all kind of got together, made a decision to say that we were going to not participate in that. And so I think collectively we have the opportunity to spread awareness and to kind of hold these companies and other individuals accountable for, you know, the, the way that they kind of capitalize on people's pain, unfortunately. So it's not about wagging a finger at somebody and saying, you're not doing this, you bad person, you. It's more so leading by example. So I want to show you how I treat individuals who are, you know, victims or survivors of crime or who are family advocates for those who have unfortunately you know, been victims of crimes um, and ha are no longer with us. So I'm hoping to lead by example, and I can only do that by looking at those who are doing it right, in my opinion. So Sarah Turney is one of those great examples. And, um, you know, Eric Carter Landine from True Consequences, both of them, you know, mm -hmm. have experienced incredible tragedies in their life and have turned it around to make something great. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could do a wag. I, I think that you have the capacity <laughs> to be a finger wag. It's really you good. Really wanted to be. Yeah. I do HR. I told you. So I know how to. <laughs> know do, how to do you do want to? Do you, do you hold the hand still and wave the finger or do you wave the whole hand? Never my mind. daughter, I follow my daughter. She's like <laughs> finger wave. She's like, no, 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 no. So she's 16 months. So I'm like, I, I'll take I'll take your lead on that one. You're better at it than I am. <laughs> she's already she's already an expert in the finger wag. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, but getting back into serious mode, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I've I've had the privilege of working with a lot of law enforcement over the last 20 years and had the pleasure of working with a lot of true crime podcasters for almost three years. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part. Yeah, the usual 80-20 rule, I think about, you know, 80% of the time, those circles overlap for real good. I think that uh, most cops, not all, uh, but many of them, you know, say, you know, the more uh, attention that I can get to my case with the limited resources that I have, so be it. So go mm -hmm. ahead and put it out there. Um, you know, I remember Darren Birch from Badge Boys podcast saying that and he's a former cop. Uh, and I think, too, that most true crime podcasters, even the ones that uh, are on the fringe that have a little bit more of a comedic tone and so mm -hmm. forth, are very, very cognizant. And I've heard this dozens of times of not victim blaming, victim shaming, making fun of victims. Mm -hmm. um, they make fun of criminals all the time. And that's, right. you know, that's kind of fair game. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's there's a nice overlap in what I continue to say that the true crime podcast community, for the most part, has a responsibility to offer a service to keep these cases alive, yes. um, to talk about what's happening so that it doesn't happen again, as you alluded to, awareness of, of what's happening, you know, for your own safety and, and so many things. So, you know, and you know, to, to get to an actual question, I remember us talking about, you know, some of these true crime podcasts that do a very good job, but will will kind of gloss over the victim and go right into the case. Like, oh, well, you know, she was such a great person and we lost the light in this world. And now let's talk about this bastard for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that, you know, but, you know, what does victim advocacy really look like? How do we how do we highlight, you know, the the victim's life? How do we give some type of healing to the families? What does victim advocacy really look like, Lainey? So for that, I, I think that's a really great question and it, it's different for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So I fell into that trap very much when I first started my show as well. It was like, you want to know about the perpetrator. You want to know the psychology behind it um, without realizing that we are replacing the victim's story with the perpetrators. And that's really kind of the antithesis of, I think, the, what everybody is really trying to do here. Um, unfortunately, the way that the media kind of works this is that the perpetrator gets kind of all the glory in this, right? I look at um, the Pamela Hupp case. You wouldn't know it if I said the Betsy Faria case. You would say, who's Betsy Faria? You know, what? Yeah. who's that? Um, you would only know that like, oh, the thing about Pam, the thing on yeah. Hulu and things like that. So the perpetrator gets kind of all of the glory and, and the victim's families are left kind of re-traumatized having to see the person who took their loved one away from them kind of glorified in the media. 
So for us as podcasters, we have a great opportunity here to um, reach out. I know it can be intimidating. I, I fell in, again, fell into that trap too, where I was like, I don't want to re-traumatize anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm too scared. But it was really because of my own discomfort. It had nothing to do with the family. It wasn't, I don't want to reach out to them because I'm worried I might hurt them. It was like, uh, I don't want anybody to yell at me. I don't want anybody to say, leave me the F alone without realizing that like if a family member didn't want their you know family story mm -hmm. told then i had no right to share it yeah. so you know i i had to kind of grapple with that whole situation but ultimately what you can do is there's tons of justice pages out there on facebook there's if if a if a crime or a case hasn't gotten a lot of media attention, a family member is, or advocate is likely behind it wanting people to cover it. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is reach out to them and say, hey, tell me this person's story. Tell me how they really were. Tell me like firsthand accounts. Um, my show is not a, a guest host type of thing or where I do interviews or anything like that. It's a narrative podcast. So I wouldn't necessarily have somebody on to share something. Um, I would, you know, have a conversation with them and then work that into my script or in my show so mm -hmm. it looks different based off of the show some people will have you know family members come on like the vanished podcast for instance mm -hmm. does family interviews you know and has actually helped solve cases um and then there are other shows that just don't do that like my show um and so really it's reaching out to the family member to give them a heads up that hey i'm, I'm wanting to cover so and so's case and i understand you know this may be difficult but i was hoping that you could share some information with me about who they were as a person you know what were they like if you're comfortable and then from there you can kind of have an engaging discussion because the victim's family or the advocates who are involved want to make sure that their story is told with care right and they want to listen to your show to say like are you a person i can trust to tell this story um and that's their right everybody feels and what i've seen on social media what i've seen on tiktok is people coming after you know, these survivors or advocates and saying, it's public domain. I can tell your story if I want to. Mm -hmm. And I, I love um, Sarah Turney kind of turning it around going, okay, then I'll tell a story about your dad. You know, I'll write a story. I'll write a whole podcast about him. I don't care. Because um, yeah. it's the same thing. You know, sure, your dad may be like nobody special in the grand scheme of things for the media. But you would be like, wait, why are you digging in my dad's life? Why are you doing this? Or why are you doing that? And it's the same thing. So for us, we have a great opportunity here to kind of shift that narrative, shift that perspective, and really involve the family members as they should. You saw the Netflix documentary thing with the whole Jeffrey Dahmer thing, where um, one of the victim's cousins came out and said, like, listen, my aunt was losing her mind in the courtroom. And mm -hmm. they're going to play that up on the Netflix, you know, documentary or special or movie or whatever. I don't know how many more movies or you know, Netflix <laughs> things we could have on Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne yeah. Gacy, Richard Ramirez. I don't know how many more we could have. It's yeah. the same story. Um, but I was I was so proud of our community for sticking together and saying, don't watch it. Like, mm -hmm. just stop. And also, these family members aren't compensated. Yeah. They again, because it's public domain so they're like oh well you know i can tell your story and it's okay because i fabricated some things and could you imagine your life being fabricated for a tv yeah and the way that i i, I look at mariah day's story um her mom was betsy faria mm -hmm. and the thing about pam on hulu was dramatized in a dark comedic type of way yeah and she was just like that's so offensive i can't even begin to describe i can't even imagine what that was like i would be pissed off if it, i lost my brother in 2009 mm -hmm. um not to anything violent but if if i had and i'm so protective over his memory i would have lost my shit i would have like totally sued everybody i could have or whatever so i give them a lot of grace and understanding and just go listen if a family member contacts me from an episode i did two years ago and is like take that off your show no problem I'm not even going to have an active discussion with you. It's removed. Sorry. Um, the, oftentimes we see advocates and survivors project onto the podcasters, which is what intimidates them, right? They, mm. they get upset. They're like, you didn't even tell me you were going to do this. You didn't even give me the awareness or whatever. And they're in pain. They're mm. dealing with this all the time. So I'm not here to engage in a discussion with you about why I was right to cover this podcast or that wasn't my intention. If you feel you want this off of, you know, my feet, it'll be off of my feet. I don't care what, you know, obligations I have to advertisers or anything like that. I can create another episode. Mm -hmm. No big deal. 
So I think people just need to be a little bit more brave when it comes to that. You know, um, you're not passionate about this at all, are you? No, no. Not at all. I mean, it's, it's just something it, I always say it's not hard to do the right thing. And everybody's yeah. like, well, sometimes it is hard. And I'm like, it really isn't. You just do it. I, I, I don't have that, um, that, that blocker in me that goes, well, mm. it could not be the right, you know, uh, I don't know. And it's just like, no, if you feel inherently that this is the right thing to do or that you should do that, then you need to do it. To me, there's no excuse after that. Now a word from one of the POCUA's proud business partners, OfficerPrivacy.com. OfficerPrivacy.com was founded by Pete James, a law enforcement professional with over 25 years of experience. Pete wanted to find a way to help law enforcement officers protect themselves and their families. So he formed a team to create a way to quickly identify and remove their information from certain sites. OfficerPrivacy.com is the result. This service is already offered through a select few of our POCUA organizations. As a listener of Public Safety Talk Radio, you can take advantage of a special offer from OfficerPrivacy.com. Go to OfficerPrivacy.com slash POCUA, and when you sign up, you'll get two additional bonuses. In addition to removing your personal information from the top 30 people search sites, they will give you your first two months of monitoring free. This is a value of $39.98. In addition to that, you'll receive a cell phone privacy device, a $19.99 value. This prevents data from leaving your cell phone when you use public charging stations and is a must when traveling. So go to officerprivacy.com slash POCUA today to take advantage of this offer and to protect your privacy. Organizations who are members of the POCUA and are interested in offering the service directly to their members, contact us at POCUA at btcinc.org. I know this is going to be surface level, um, mm-hmm. but you know, if you if you look at true crime podcasts, true crime entertainment as entertainment, mm-hmm. I mean it's 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 always been my take that that in order to engage and educate, you need to entertain because yes. yeah, it's as I think of one particular podcast that I won't mention. It does a really does a really nice job of fact checking and and having having everything you know reviewed and has the right intentions of helping victims and helping solve cases, um, but the podcast in and of itself is boring. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, it's it's like you know, cure for insomnia, and, and and it was a point that I made is that you 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 need to entertain in order to do all these good things. Yeah. And I think, too, from a surface level, even even uh, less than the obvious, which is it's the right thing to do, is that on a surface level, it is, to me at least, much more entertaining when you have the victim's family, when you have these people that have participated, um, participate is probably not the best word, but who have lived this unfortunate mm-hmm. tragedy and are sharing their stories. And you can see for some, it's actually cathartic to talk about yes. that. Yeah. So I, I think that in, in involving you know, the individuals that were involved in this case just makes for a better product as well as is doing good um yes. because otherwise you think and i listen to a lot of true crime podcasts you know it's like all right so we're kind of guessing here we're filling in a gap there you know mm-hmm. we're we're giving our opinion here which is fine but then we need to have the caveat of this is my thought on this and so forth so yeah yeah i think that that's an, an important point yeah, to to another point, which is your passion for victim advocacy, you even changed the name of your podcast. Yes. Um, from true crime fans to true crime cases with with Lainey, which I mm-hmm. applaud you for Thanks. because I hate the term true crime fans. Yeah. But which is <laughs> why. The club. Yeah, which is which is why I, I never use it, even in podcast magazine and the writing. Yeah. I use the phrase true crime enthusiasts. 
because it takes on a completely different dynamic. Talk about you know, changing the name of the podcast. And, you know, was that hard for you or was oh, it yeah. like you just like you just said, it's like, I want to do the right thing. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. So I started podcasting in 2016 and I used mm-hmm. to run a Facebook group um, that was like, I now I can't even remember the name of it but it was it got passed on to me randomly so I was like oh yeah sure I'll moderate it no big deal um but it had like something something fan club in it and so I was like oh I'll just name my podcast that because I couldn't think of an literally no original name could be thought of for me (laughs) so I was like sure I'll just do true crime fan club like no big deal I'll be the president of it you know like that's how it's like a like a what it like a letterman jacket situation you know what i mean like like a glee club (laughs) those types of things i'm like that's the kind of club like we all like true crime you guys get it um and i was fine with the name for a while right like i was like it differentiates me i was very successful and still am thankfully but when i met you know mariah day julie murray i got to know sarah turney better and um eric carter landine's become one of my really great friends i was like I feel like trash (laughs) trying to say my name. Um, And I cringed literally. I, you know, it was, I think maybe for the last year or so, I was like, I really want to change the name of my show, but I can't think of any name that would work. I, that it was literally a creative process that I, I just didn't have a name for it. It's like, I've, I've wanted to change it for the the last year and a half, but I couldn't think of anything. And you know, from, from my own ego, I was worried, what's this going to do to my brand? Are mm-hmm. people going to know? Are people going to care? Are they going to go, oh, you're so soft. You're such a snowflake. Of course, you're doing your name for, you know, the woke mob. And now you're going to, you know, whatever. So I was worried about that because I was like, you know, I've had such a good career in this and a good, you know, longevity and being able to build my show into what it is. And I have people that I employ. So mm-hmm. it didn't just affect me. But ultimately, the show's name was going to change. I just couldn't think of a name. And then um, I forgot what it was. But, you know, after, again, I it was just after the True Crime Podcast Festival had wrapped in August of this year. And I was just like, okay, I got to do it. I just got to come up with one. And mm-hmm. so um, I had a show on Spotify Live called True Crime Convos with Lainey. Mm-hmm. Um And so I was like, okay, maybe I can make it true crime convos. And I was workshopping it with my friends and other podcasters um, because everybody knows me, knows my intention and stuff. So they were like, yeah, the show, you know, the name's cringy, but people know you. And I was like, yeah, but those people who don't know me, I remember seeing comments like in 2017 or 18 in Facebook groups being like, wow, that name really throws me off. And I was like, oh, so I would go in and, you know, defend it and stuff. It was a whole mess, but when I finally, everybody's like, okay, well, true crime convos, are you going to be talking to people? Cause it gives me the impression that you're going to have like a conversation with somebody. I was like, oh no, it's just a name for the other show that I did. So I thought I'd just use that one. <laughs> and they're like, doesn't work. Doesn't yeah. work. And so I was like, well, I don't like calling these, um, you know, these cases stories. I have a problem yeah. doing that. Cause I'm like, okay. it's like a storytelling thing. I was like, oh, I, you know, I don't like doing that. Like I'm telling you, a, you know, a bedtime story. No. So I was like, well, I call them cases. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to call them true crime cases with Lainey. And literally I posted it in the group. Um, I had my friend who did my original logo. I said, change my logo. My husband's my IT because he does information security. And I was like, go and change everything Mm -hmm. to redirect to true crime cases. I updated all my social media. I put out a statement and everything. And I was like, okay, I'm done. And I was so nervous. I was so worried and scared and everybody has received the name um really well everybody has reached out to me that I care about anyways um you know and I told my listeners I was like I was worried about this I was worried about the name changing you know what like if you don't want to listen to my show because I changed the name Mm -hmm. of my podcast then the content of it never mattered to you so go I I'm not going to be offended if you decide to stop listening to my show um and it's worked out really great so I'm very thankful that I had the support of my friends and, you know, the true crime community in that regard to really kind of push myself out of that zone. I did keep true crime fan club kind of as a media company name because I don't mm-hmm. want anybody to take it yeah. <laughs> and use it, you know, and be like, <laughs> right. Oh, Hey, here it is. Um, not from an IP perspective, but truly just because I, I don't want somebody to capitalize on something that I think shouldn't be out there as a podcast name. So I'm like, I'll keep it as TCFC Media. True, everybody knows it stands for True Crime Fan Club, whatever. Mm-hmm. 
but it's in the background where it should be. It shouldn't be something that's at the forefront of anything, you know, and it prevents people from creating podcasts about with that name. So you think, but I mean, I'll hire a lawyer and go after you. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that little note out there. I was like, this does not mean the name is up for grabs, my friends. I still mm -hmm. own the website address and stuff. So I'm trying to prevent people from, you know, taking something that shouldn't be out there in the first place. Yeah. So I'm protecting the name only in the sense that I don't want it to be used by anybody else to try and capitalize off of it, but like, you know, make something gross out of it. Um, so that's really what I did. And so True Crime Cases was born and it's been great ever since. And so it's been weird trying to call my show because for the longest time I've been calling it TCFC. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, you know, listeners have referred to it too, because it's a long name. So now it's like CCC with Laney. And yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I can't get away from the acronym. So it is what it is. It's but, shorter yeah. now. So it works. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, TCC it is. <laughs> so I'm like, TCFC. I mean, you know what I mean? So yeah. Some, <laughs> it still some, lives out there. Yeah. Sometimes the easiest branding is just the simplest branding. Yeah, just True say what crime it is. cases. That's what it is. That's with what me. we're talking about. <laughs> with me <laughs> that's the that's the difference <laughs> so yeah but I mean I just had to do it. it it was time and um I was scared really for no reason I created that whole scenario in my head and I'm very glad I did it and um the people who I wanted to make the change for reached out to me directly and and thanked me for it and said like Good. I'm proud of you I'm glad you did that thank you for doing that and thank you for saying it was because of me and I was like oh my god like it's, it truly did change my life. It It is never, I, I told you this separately, but it, it, it was never something that I was always focused on right mm -hmm. until then. And realizing I'm like, once you meet these people, you humanize them in a way that's yeah. very different than when you are just a casual listener of true crime content, because I don't know, not everybody is the same way, but I'm very imaginative. So when I listen to um, podcasts, especially true crime podcasts, and I haven't heard about a case, I don't have an idea of what the, you know, the victim looks like, or what the perpetrator looks like, or who anybody involved looks like. So I create these kind of scenarios in my head, or I'm envisioning it in my head, like mm -hmm. a little book, you know, and it's only different when you finally look up the case and you're like, oh, that's what they look like, or oh, that's not at all how I imagine them. Um, it's, it's very different and shocking to the system. I think when you meet them in person, you're like, oh wow and that's kind of what these festivals and cons kind of do is they I think the goal behind them ultimately is is hopefully the same in that you're trying to show the humanity behind mm -hmm. these cases and you know some of that some of them do it well I think and others don't <laughs> but ultimately like all that matters for me is that you know, it changed my life. It changed how I operate. And so I have a great platform within the festival to be able to continue mm -hmm. that mission on and to create a safe space for other people. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, let's talk about that as we begin to wrap up a little bit. Talk about the True Crime Podcast Festival. You've had that for a few years. Um, the next one is coming up in Austin, I believe, in yes. August of 2023, so about 10 months from now. Yes. You talk about the Victim Advocacy Foundation for this type of an event. So, you know, um, I've attended multiple podcast festivals and uh, specifically true crime related um and for me the reason that i created the true crime podcast well now it's true crime and paranormal podcast festival but we're still going to call it tcpf because it's easier um but the I reason appreciate that, that but go ahead. <laughs> so, well, everybody you're welcome um but my co-founder lisa and i were really just you know wanting to hang out with our friends we really like the idea of just podcasters getting together with the same, you know, mindset of, I want to, you like listening to my podcast. I like making it. This is cool. We're meeting and talking and hanging out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really how it was. It was just supposed to be a giant meetup for all of us. And then, you know, people were like, well, we'd like to hear your thoughts on this, or we'd like to hear your thoughts. So we developed programming for it. We were hit with a pandemic. So we, you know, it, it took us down for a minute for 2020, 2021, we came back. It was a smaller thing, but then we came oh. back and for Dallas and it was much, you know, much more to my expectations of what I was wanting for our festival. So we had great programming slated and it was the first time we really had 
um, family advocates and survivors of crime wanting to take part in these panels. Mm -hmm. Because my concern was, listen, you know, I don't want somebody walking around with like murderabilia or like, you know, a serial killer Mm t-shirt or something like that, like bloody whatever. And it's the person, for instance, like I'll use um, Kathy Klein Rubin, who is one of the survivors of the Golden State Killer. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want somebody going, you know, having a cute little Etsy shirt that somebody made with a quote of the Golden State Killer on and having a victim walk by and go, okay, this is not the place for me. Like you, Mm -hmm. you have no idea my connection to this. So we made a first stance that we are not going to like celebrate any perpetrators. There's no murderabilia, no, no serial killer merchandise that can be sold. So there's nothing there that would have like knives with um, blood on them or Mm -hmm. something, you know, like anything that was too extreme. We were like, no, that's not going to happen. No cases and no panels could, they had to follow the same rules. Basically it's like, Mm -hmm. you're not glorifying anybody. This is victim centered, victim focused. And they need to be respectful, considering that you may have survivors and advocates in the audience listening to you. And that's exactly what happened. We had, you know, we had Mariah Day, we had um, Julie Murray, we had Eric and everybody else. There were other survivors there. One of um, the women whose mom died, I forgot her name, Michelle Rosen, I believe, um, through the Tylenol murders. Mm -hmm. So she was there too, you know, so it was just a whole bunch of bunch of survivors walking around and stuff so I was very like cognizant that you know I want them to feel safe here so we created a panel that um, Eric moderated and it included Julie and Mariah where we focused back on the victims and it was Mm -hmm. called refocus bringing the victims back into focus so they talked about how the impact of this industry or what the impact of this industry has had on them Um, both of them unfortunately have had really kind of negative experiences on social media um, with other podcasters or with other media personalities um, not respecting their you know their story and you know kind of taking advantage of them and so Mm. it was really great and powerful to see people walking out of that panel going wow you changed a lot of things for me like you humanized a piece that I didn't even think needed to be said or you know it makes me think about the type of content I'm consuming, what podcasts I lend my ear to, what podcasts I support. And I want to make sure they're ethical. And so many people on social media will always ask you like, okay, well, give me your list of podcasts, like which podcasts are ethical. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, Sarah says the same thing. I say the same thing. It's like, that's not my job to go through and listen to other people. Like if it feels gross, stop listening to it. Mm -hmm. And if it's fine, then you're fine. You know, like you determine what's ethical for you, what works for you. And those shows that aren't doing it, because there are shows that, you know, aren't respectful to anybody, um, you know, you want to kind of see them out the door. So we we don't we we don't operate on an invite basis. So anybody who wants to come to the festival can come to the festival. Um, But we will if we feel like your content is, you know, disrespectful in any way or doesn't meet kind of our goal then we'll just refund you your money send you on your way but most people especially podcasters who do want to come know that that's our mission and goal Mm -hmm. and so i think the people who are geared towards caring about um, victim advocacy and the ethics behind true crime and how to consume it ethically are the ones who want to come to the festival those Mm -hmm. who are looking for like entertainment or you know wanting to be razzled and dazzled in that way there are so many other festivals you can go to that will meet those expectations and needs for you and they will charge you accordingly. Um, <laughs> but we are not that way. It's, it's, we talked about this too, but Lisa's my, my business person. I'm not for profit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so money will never, money will never get in the way of what I'm trying to do. It will never compromise the mission. It will never, I'll never say, you know what, I'll take on this sponsor and you know, what if I like, I don't know, can't think of a, if somebody came in and said, I love serial killer sponsor or something like that, <laughs> I wouldn't be like, you know what, I'm going to take their money and be fine with it and have their logo all over the place. It, it's not something that would ever happen. So the companies that we work with also um, need to be ethical in the way that they present themselves. Um, and so that's what we do. 
Well, fortunately, I haven't yet seen an I Love Serial Killers type of business or organization. So I don't think you have to worry about that one. But, you know, before, <laughs> but before we close up, how can our folks out there that want to come to, want to be involved in the True Crime Podcast Festival, how can they best find you and this event? So... Easy, 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 easy. <laughs> TrueCrimePodcastFestival.com has all of the information. You can also find us on the social media channels under True Crime Podcast Festival or TCPF Official. Um, I'm literally all over Instagram and Twitter for the most part and um, update the rev- website regularly. Um, but yeah, so I mean, we have the early bird tickets out now and eventually um, we will be, as podcasters begin to register, um, we will be offering discount codes for those particular podcasters and their audience to kind of thank them for, for coming and all that fun jazz, but we have a full three day worth of uh, programming slated for next year, because that was kind of the biggest feedback that we've got was that they wanted more, you know, live shows, they wanted more panels and Mm -hmm. they wanted more round tables. I think for us, what makes us unique in that sense is that we do have the round table option, which for me, as in, you know, a listener first, that's what I say. I was like, I'm a listener first when it comes mm-hmm. to true crime podcasts. So, um, I, I create content that I want to listen to for myself. So have I listened to my own show? Yes, of course. Does my husband? No, um, <laughs> but I don't make content for him. I make it for myself. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that it's, it's worthwhile for everybody. So, um, we, I like the the interaction with roundtables that you get to have this kind of one-on-one. And I think for anybody who truly is invested in true crime and truly wants to know like the psychology behind it or just ask those why questions in a safe and respectful way. Folks, go out and check out True Crime Podcast Festival. Um, check out True Crime Cases with Lainey. And Lainey... Thank mm-hmm. you for spending some time with us this morning. Oh I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Our pleasure. And thank you to all of you who have either watched or listened to this episode of Public Safety Talk Radio. And we'll be back with you next week with another great guest. Public Safety Talk Radio was produced by the POCUA. The POCUA is a consortium of financial institutions serving law enforcement, as well as other first responders and public safety professionals. To learn more about our association and to find one of our credit unions or service providers near you, go to www.policecreditunions.com. And always remember, if you aren't working with one of our POCUA credit unions, you're just banking with an institution that just so happens to serve first responders. As a public safety professional, You and your family deserve better. Find a POCUA credit union today.